the Agile brand. Welcome to the Innovation Economy podcast, where we look at the factors that drive business growth, including how people, processes, platforms, and places work together to create the future of work. I'm your co-host, Bonnie Habian. I'm a CMO, author, speaker, branding expert, and passionate content creator. This episode is part of our Brand the Change series, which focuses on how entrepreneurs and engaged employees can leverage their personal brand and superpowers to support their company, showcase their skill sets, and create value. To listen to the latest episodes or to sign up for the Innovation Economy newsletter, go to innovationeconomy.show or click follow on your favorite podcast app to make sure you hear the latest episodes. And now, on to the show. Today, we're talking about more than the resume. We're delving into 2024 and beyond with a focus on the comprehensive approach of taking your professional persona to a new level. I am extremely pleased to have Sarah Johnston on the show today. If any guest really speaks to the brand, the change series, she does. Why is that? Well, she is not only a former recruiter and executive resume writer, but the founder of Briefcase Coach an executive resume and coaching service, and she is a real innovator. Currently closing in on a million LinkedIn followers. That's right, a million LinkedIn followers. She clearly demonstrates how a professional can develop influence through sharing their expertise and more importantly, telling their story. So I'm going to take it a step further and say that in the midst of innovation, Sarah helps professionals leverage all of the digital tools there are to be the best and to market and position themselves for success. So welcome, Sarah. I am so, so happy to have you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for asking me to be a part of your podcast. I've been a big fan of your content on LinkedIn for a while. Oh, well, thank you. And same here. In fact, that is what is so amazing about LinkedIn. You get to meet new people and learn from people. And just like how you and I came together, I get to now learn from you, which brings me to my first question. I would love to hear you describe the top three things that professionals need to really be aware of in our current hiring marketplace. And when they're looking to put themselves out there for consideration in today's world, what should they really be focused on? Well, first of all, I think a reality check is needed for some people. This is not 2021. We are unfortunately not in a candidate-driven market anymore, and job seekers need to both be both flexible and more strategic when they approach their job search. For example, when it comes to being flexible, candidates will need to bend on location. You can't really stick your foot in the ground and say, I'm not going to come into the office or I'm only going to come into the office on Mondays. Companies are going to be demanding that people either work in a hybrid capacity or in a full-time in-office capacity. Because as of 2023, only 12% of full-time employees even worked from home. And that number is probably going to be less than that in 2024. Candidates are also going to need to be, unfortunately, more flexible on compensation. We're not seeing the comp ban adjustments that we were seeing in 2021 and early 2022. So that's something that people need to be aware of. And then, Bonnie, you know this from kind of working with people throughout your career at the high level, is is that companies right now are a little bit more hesitant to post executive jobs online Mm -hmm. because of just market transitions. They're having to do rifts and, you know, the news is, you know, not favorable for some employers right now. And so posting a an executive position with a, a high salary band is not a good look for some companies. So these mm-hmm. jobs are hidden jobs or mm-hmm. jobs that maybe are not posted widely, but are shared only with some executive search recruiters who are recruiting for these jobs on the side. So executives are going to have to be aware and, and, and thoughtful about how they approach this hidden job market. Well, it sounds like the pendulum is starting to swing a little bit more back to the employer, right? A couple of years ago, you felt that, you know, I'm only going to work here. I want to work remote. I require this. That seems to have tightened up a little bit. So it's going to be a little bit more, like you said, driving employees or potential employees to be a little bit more flexible. That being said, what are some of the bucket list of assets you think that these employees possible new employees, um, prospects, et cetera, need to have in order to really differentiate themselves from the competition? Are there a few assets you would say, hey, listen, you need to focus on this a lot? Yeah, of course, I would say the resume. 
But equally important to having a polished resume is the importance of having a strong LinkedIn profile. And, and not only a strong LinkedIn profile, but I would say that people need to have a strong target company list. And this hmm. is one of the things that people often overlook. They think, okay, I need a resume. I need to update my LinkedIn. But they don't go ahead and do the, the due diligence necessary to execute their job search. A lot of people start their search without having a real understanding of all of their options, where they could work, who could hire someone with their skill set, who they know that has connections at that particular employer. Creating that spreadsheet is so important in your search. Well, let's talk a little bit about that digital landscape too in the search. Now you're saying it's important to have your LinkedIn profile shining as well as your resume. I have heard so much now about SEO, keywords, making sure you have keywords in both your resume and in LinkedIn because of these job portals. Can you kind of give a little bit of the lay of the land where that's concerned now and why that should be a priority? Oh, yeah. Things have changed a lot. Back in 2006, when I first started on LinkedIn, I think most people knew that they needed to have a headshot, maybe their title, their market title, and then they just copied and pasted something that their marketing department sent them about their company. And then maybe back in 2010, 2012, people evolved, and then they just started putting all the buzzwords that they possibly could on their profile. It was a third-person thing, and somebody would say something like, Sarah Johnston is a highly accomplished executive resume writer and, and just as many buzzwords as they right. possibly could. Well, now we're seeing a shift where we want storytelling. We want the human. Mm -hmm. We want to connect with real people. And so what I'm telling people as they're writing their LinkedIn profiles is, yes, of course, use keywords. Make sure you're using the words that a recruiter would use to search for someone with your skill set, but then also Think about your why. Why do you do the work that you do? How can you hook your audience into your story and draw the reader into your content so they'll want to consume it? So that's that's the goal when we're, we're writing a LinkedIn profile. Well, I hear that about everything now. Storytelling is the way to go. No matter what you're doing in life, if you're looking to position yourself or to um, network, get some eyes to people to really see, okay, this person's a little bit different you have to be able to tell a good story. And so that brings me to kind of something I want to ask you. What are some of the pet peeves that you may have or that you see where you're like, this person is a little bit behind the eight ball because they're not heeding my advice and they're not seeing what the market is demanding. They are not looking at the innovation and what the future is asking them to have. Anything you see with resistance that you're saying, hey, you really need to kind of take this into consideration going forward and, and, and look towards this a little bit. Yeah, kind of going back to what we were just saying before about the storytelling element, it, it is a pet peeve of mine when I see people who are just dialing it in on LinkedIn. Maybe they just have a profile for the sake of having a profile, mm -hmm. but they haven't optimized it. It's in the third person. It's all that keyword buzzwords. I want people to take the time to tell a thoughtful story. Also, would think the thing that really feels behind the eight ball is the person who's not clear on who their target audience is or has a clear understanding of what their value proposition is, before you write any of your documents, it's so important to, to kind of go back to the basics. Think about who you're marketing to, who your target audience is, what they care about. Right. Make sure that your documents share that. You know, and I think that brings me to something else I wanted to ask. How much now have we moved past the spoken word and come more in line with the digital presence and what that means now to both a job search and to growing a person's brand. It used to be just that you would have an interview, cover letter, et cetera. No, it's so much more now. It's digital search. It's that storytelling. It's the presence and kind of that first digital impression you get from someone. Tell me a little bit about that. And what are you seeing uh, with that in the, the marketplace with respect to recruiters, employers, and how that really sometimes helps put someone at the top of the pile? Yeah, as you said, people are now Googling you before they meet you in person. So that digital first impression is so important. There's a stat and actually multiple stats that between 60 and 90% of employers will Google you before they invite you in for an interview. And so making sure that you control what is online, what your brand says about you online before they meet you in person is so important. We live a significant piece of our lives online and we need to make sure that the, the message that we present about ourselves is the right message that we want our intended audience to consume. 
Well, I think, you know what, that also brings it to, to like when you start talking about corporate culture and understanding if you align with another company or not, I think you can start to see some of those threads when you start to put yourself out there digitally, if you are being attracted to vice versa, a company is looking at you or, or you're looking at a certain company because you seem to have an alignment of values or cultural values, that probably helps as well, kind of get people to move a little bit closer to one company versus another, all based on that digital presence and that digital sort of pre-interview. Oh yeah, absolutely. Companies are spending millions of dollars on their brands, their image, even their employer branding. They've got entire employer branding teams dedicated to how they market themselves to future candidates. And so you need to put some thought into how you're marketing and branding yourself to employers as well. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you like what you're hearing, I invite you to check out another podcast from the Agile brand. It's called B2B Agility, and it's hosted by me, Greg Kilstrom. The B2B Agility podcast looks at the factors that drive success in B2B marketing with a focus on the people, processes, data, and platforms that make B2B brands stand out and thrive in a competitive marketplace. You can find B2B Agility on this podcast platform or wherever you normally listen. Before we get back to the show, I just wanted to remind you to hit the follow or subscribe button on your app to make sure you get notified when new episodes of this show are available. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. What three hard skills and soft skills do you see evolving given kind of our rapid, dynamic, digital technology kind of trajectory over the next five to 10 years that you you start seeing coming into the forefront for, for potential candidates? Well, inclusion was one of the biggest buzzwords of 2020 to 2022. As an, as an executive resume writer and, and branding person. I spent a lot of time helping my clients during this time period emphasize DNI as a soft skill. I would say this is now no longer or it's a declining HR priority for for many organizations. I think it's still important. I think candidates should still be aware of this and think about examples that demonstrate inclusion, but it's no longer a top priority. I think adaptability is going to be one of the most important soft skills in 2024, 2025, as we continue to see market volatility and lots of companies make swift changes. And then I think one that we're not hearing a lot right now is the term unifier. Um, I think it's going to be a really big soft skill as the U.S. Census projections talk about the fact that about 12,000 people turn 65 every day over the next year. And so we're going to see a huge shift in boomers retiring Mm -hmm. and a great need for Gen X and millennials to take on larger leadership roles and leadership responsibilities. And so as these boomers retire, there's going to be an emphasis in the importance of intergenerational collaboration and knowledge transfer. And that's what you mean by unifier, kind of bringing together, collaborating, being able to build teams. I would imagine that would be a skill that is something that's going to continue to be important regardless of what our our world does uh, digitally or technology-wise, right? Absolutely. And then, of course, soft skill, hard skill, the leveraging AI. And, and we'll continue to talk about that. That's you know, 90% of the news these days is about the impact of AI. I think you can't sleep on this. You have to follow and continue to follow how AI is going to shift and change your industry. Yep. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, Elon Musk thinks that, or at least he's been quoted as saying that he thinks AI could possibly take every single job that we currently have. But the beauty in that is that perhaps those mundane tasks that we don't like doing anyhow could be taken over by AI and allow us to be a little bit more creative and spend our time doing things that are of of a higher level. Uh, One thing I always have heard and truly believe is that AI can't dream, right? It can't dream. And I, I, I have some solace in that because at some point you want to think that it does have some limitations, but in terms of the prospective employees and kind of where the job market is going, are you finding people are very fearful of AI or are they understanding the opportunity it also presents? Oh, I'm seeing two different buckets. I see the people who are so scared And they have a kind of a limited mindset of this is going to take over my job and I'm not going to be able to evolve and grow and I'm going to become obsolete. And there are the other people who have said, this is the best thing that has happened and I can't wait to learn everything I can about this so I can work smarter and be more efficient. And so, you know, I find myself in the middle. I've got an, I work in an industry that is going to be greatly impacted by AI, like many of the listeners today. And so 
you know, my thought process here is, is relationships. AI cannot do relationships like humans can do relationships. And so the more I emphasize human relationships and leveraging people and talent, the more successful my business is going to be able to continue to be. And that goes back to storytelling because storytelling is all about connecting. And if if we really look at our entire life purpose. It is really just about connecting. So if you can continue to make that and bubble that up as to being your top priority in everything you do, those relationships really will be very, very powerful, important, soft skills, especially as we continue to evolve and grow. I do think from an AI standpoint, those folks who do embrace it and say, hey, I'm going to figure out how to help me in my job are going to have a leg up. That fear alone is not a good thing to be having you get a little paralyzed and then aren't going to embrace and learn as much as you can about something that may end up helping you in the future, not hurting you. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So this is a little off topic, but I have to ask you, as you say, everyone asks you, how in the world did you amass 1 million LinkedIn followers? I can't even imagine. And I know I have so many creator friends and friends out there that are looking just to continue to create a strong network of folks, but A million followers is just a tremendous amount. And A, I applaud you. B, I need to know your secret sauce. Give it to me. (laughs) Well, I've been doing this for a really long time. I think I mentioned to you earlier that I gave a talk back in 2006 or 2007 to the Augusta, Georgia Metro Chamber of Commerce on how to leverage LinkedIn. So I've been on LinkedIn for a long time. I have been creating content consistently for the last seven years, almost three to seven days a week. I'm writing new original content. I was named a LinkedIn top voice in 2019. And I do think that that did give me a solid boost in terms of the number of followers that I got, but I will give you this piece of advice. And this is something a lot of people don't think about. I bet your best post gets the same eyeballs, same number of eyeballs as my best post. The thing about LinkedIn is that followers kind of matter, kind of don't. They're almost more of a vanity metric. And LinkedIn gives everybody, in a lot of ways, a blank slate. And so if you write something amazing, it has the ability to go viral in the same way that if I write something amazing, it has the ability to go viral. And so our numbers probably aren't that drastically different when it comes to post engagement and post impressions. So the bottom line is really shouldn't worry about the vanity metrics. That's not why we're out there. We're out there to serve others, provide value to others, and and becoming worth knowing because you're giving up something that is of value to someone else that may help solve a problem, make them feel good, whatever it is. It's kind of that, you know, stay stay kind of focused on the purpose and the reason why you're doing it in the first place. Really don't pay attention so much to those vanity metrics. But I do have a question for you. In today's world as well, I've seen it so much post-pandemic, that people are putting an extra effort and time in developing their own personal brand, whether they are still working full-time for a company or whether they're out on their own. What are you seeing, especially with the next generation? And and how do you kind of guide some of your prospective employers or those who you're, you're helping, you know, find another job? Good thing to do, bad thing to do. What do you think? Great question. I think it all comes down to knowing your target audience and knowing what your target audience cares about. I I work primarily with executives and I have a very recent example from the last probably 48 hours. An executive reached out to me who has been a longtime client. They just got an executive vice president position with a Fortune 50 company. And the reason that they got this position is because they obviously were a great candidate. They had a great resume but they were highly visible. They started creating content on LinkedIn and recruiters were able to see them. They were they had a likable presence on the platform and they got to interview for that opportunity. So I do think it can help because the name of the game in terms of content creation is creating visibility for yourself and for other people. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And that's really kind of music to my ears in some respects because I think we all, at the end of the day, we all work very hard. You just want people to know what you're good at. You know, I mean, sometimes we're not very good at expressing our own value. And if you keep your talents hidden, then you're not going to be able to survive and thrive, I would think, as much in this digital world. So I think all that you're explaining to me right now is kind of where we're headed and it will evolve. And I think you're going to see more of it. And so one of the things I always like to do when I end the show is to give my listeners three takeaways that they can walk away with and say, okay, I'm going to practice that or I'm going to try that. So if you can give me, Three skills professionals should really focus on right now 
to be ready for the next three to five years to crush it. I know we talked a little about soft skills, hard skills, but if we bubble up and say three areas of focus you need to look at right now that you aren't doing in order to help you really get ahead of the game, what would you suggest? To reiterate the thought that we just shared, it's understand how your industry is changing, play with AI, learn to work smarter. I would also say that there has never been a better time in history to learn how to communicate better. We've got fantastic tools like Grammarly, which will help edit your text and give you suggestions. We've got GPT, which can help refine your messaging. And we've got Udly, which you can use as to practice your speech and and get vocal prompts. So these three tools can help you be the best communicator that you've ever been. And then lastly, and just we hit on this earlier, but I want to reiterate it. Figure out ways that you can gain visibility and eyeballs. No one cares more about your career than you. And maybe that means posting on LinkedIn. Maybe that's creating your own beehive newsletter. Or maybe that's volunteering to be a part of an organization, SIG group. Whatever that is, you need to do it consistently. And I want to just mention this to your audience. You asked me earlier how I gained a million views or a million followers on LinkedIn. And, And I meant to tell you that I was like many of your followers or your listeners too. I was a mom of, you know, little babies living in Ohio when I first really started creating content on LinkedIn. And the thing that creating and putting yourself out there and gaining visibility does is you have to know your your topic and your subject matter. So I started reading every day. Every day I was reading so that I could create. And by reading, I was learning. And now I would say that I really am a true expert in my my industry. And I know more about resumes than probably the majority of people know about resumes, but because it's because I spent so much time reading so that there, therefore I could write content about it. Well, I am definitely for sure know that you are an expert. And again, um, you know, I have, I just think that what you do is tremendously um, impactful. And I think the value you brought today is going to be very helpful for some of our listeners so that they can plan and make sure that they are off to a great start in 2024 and beyond. So it is so wonderful to have you, Sarah. Uh, I definitely recommend anyone looking to consume some great content and stay on the forefront of professional development to follow Sarah. And if you want to learn more about her, her information will be in the links in the show notes. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Thanks again for listening to the Innovation Economy podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.innovationeconomy.show. The Innovation Economy is produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Until next time, let's keep innovating. The Agile Brand.